1 Corinthians chapter 2 and in verse 1. If you have your Bibles there, say amen. amen. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with enticing excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I was determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of men's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. Amen. I I want you to think about our text for a minute. The Apostle Paul who wrote this, uh, this letter, the Apostle Paul was one of the most educated men in the Jewish, uh, in the Jewish religion, in the Jewish faith. He was one of the most educated men in the world. He was actually Saul of Tarsus and Tarsus was one of the centers of learning during that time period, it'd be like the Harvard, the Yale, the Princeton of our time period. And we see just how intellectual that the Apostle Paul is throughout his ministry when he travels in the every region. Uh, he, he, he knew multiple languages. He knew the culture. He knew the mythologies. He knew the theologies of every region and every precinct. And that, in large part, is why God called him. Now, with the apostles, we know that the the 12 that followed Jesus, they were unlearned men, or as we'd say in the South, they're ignorant. Ignorant. They were ignorant. But but the Bible says they were unlearned men, but whenever they spoke, you had to take note that they had been with Jesus. Why? Because it wasn't about how eloquent they were. They didn't have the refinery and sophistication of some theologian. But when they spoke, they spoke with power and they spoke with anointing. Right. Um, And so they brought the gospel to Jerusalem and Judea. But when it came time for there to be an apostle to the Gentiles, God called Saul of Tarsus. And, And his zeal for God, even before he became a Christian, His zeal for God and his zeal for truth was so strong that when he thought the Christians were uh, heretics, he was persecuting the Christians. Now, you and I today, we'd look on the outside and we'd see his actions and we'd say, what an evil man. But God looked beyond his actions. God looked into his heart and saw a man who had great zeal for God. And wanted to see righteousness and holiness in the world. And so God called him. God called him out of darkness. Called him to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We talked a little bit about it last week. He was stricken blind. And uh, God said, I want you to go to a street called Straight. And there I'm going to send my prophet to you. And my prophet's going to tell you what you should do. And uh, when Ananias came, he said, the Lord has sent me to lay hands on you that you would receive your sight. Uh, that, 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 and, and he told him what he must do. He said, arise. This is the Apostle Paul sharing his testimony. He said, Ananias said to me, arise. Why tarriest thou? Be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Everyone say the gospel. gospel. That's the good gospel. And so the apostle Paul starts traveling around the known world. And and when he uh, went to Mars Hill, he was quoting their philosophers and poets. And when he went to this town, he would quote their philosophers and poets and their theologies so that he had a a starting place, a common ground uh, with them, a connection with them intellectually. And then he would take them from that intellectual connection and bring them to a full understanding of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And, and that's a template for us today. I'm going to say that again. That's a template for us today. When you talk to people of other persuasions, other denominations, other religions, it's important to start with something that opens up their heart. 
Amen. The Lord has uh, given me a gift. There's been uh, three times in my life that I was able to bring a Muslim to Christianity. And the reason I was able to do that was because I showed them a knowledge of their faith, what they believed, why they believed it. And it would open up their heart to them. And then I would, as Aquila and Priscilla would say, show unto them a more perfect way and bring them to Jesus. Amen. So that's what the Apostle Paul would do. He's a very brilliant man. But when he went to Corinth, when he went to Corinth, he said, I did not come to you with excellency of speech. I did not come to you with enticing words of men's wisdom. I did not come to impress you with what I know. He said, for when I was among you, I was determined not to know anything save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hallelujah. Is that all Paul knew? No. Paul teaches us most of the theology that we have. He wrote most of the New Testament and most of the the Christian theology that we have is based on the letters that the Apostle Paul writ. He He was a brilliant mind. But he said, when I came to you, I was determined to know nothing save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Because that's where it all begins. The gospel of Jesus Christ is where it all starts. You can't just adopt Christianity as a philosophy. You can't just embrace Christianity as a good way to live your life. No, you have to start with the gospel. With the gospel. See, there's a God-shaped hole in your heart. And we try to cram so many square pegs into that round hole. Uh, Religion, uh, relationships, Mm -hmm. jobs, uh, substance abuse, uh, fraternities, uh, clubs, social clubs, traditions, entertainment. What is the result of us trying to cram other things into that spot, into that center throne room of our heart that is supposed to be given to him? We end up in depression. We end up with a lack of self-worth. But I have good news for you. Did you know that no matter how much your heart has longed for God, That he desires intimacy with you yes, he does. far more than you desire intimacy with him. He desires to commune with you and have a relationship with you far more than you could ever understand. Yes. How much so? He robed himself in flesh. Yes, he, he came to this earth for a humanity that was on a path to destruction and humanity that was on a path to to an end, a permanent and total and complete end. And he sacrificed himself for you because he wants to be close to you. Can you say thank you, Jesus? John, one of the apostles, said it this way. In this was manifest the love of God toward you. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that while we were yet sinners, he loved us. He loved us and sent his son to die for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That we might live through Christ. Through Christ. So this is good news. Why? This is good news because you're a sinner. (laughs) Brother Hayes, I'm a good person. Don't say that to a righteous, holy, pure God. 
Because to a righteous, holy, pure God, you on your best day yes. are not good enough to make heaven your home. All of our righteousness, our righteousness, yes. is as filthy rags in the sight of God. You on your best day cannot earn your way into heaven. Amen? Amen. Yes. And all, since all of sin, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. There has to be a blood payment for death, there ha uh, for sin. And, and it's not just talking about a physical death. It's talking about an eternal separation from God, the second death, the worst death of all. And so you've heard me say it before, and I'm going to say it again, that old song, I owed a debt I could not pay. And he paid a debt he did not owe. Hallelujah. Without controversy, Paul said, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God was justified of the spirit. God was seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, and believed on into in the world, and received up into glory. So why the cross? Because Jesus never sinned. And since he never sinned, but paid the sin debt, you can apply his payment to your life. Because he paid the sin debt, but never sinned, his sin payment can be applied to your account. I want you to consider our text. I want you to consider our text. He said, I was determined to know nothing among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was determined to know nothing among you, save the gospel. If you have not started at the gospel, then you've not started your Christian journey. It doesn't matter how many good things that Jesus said that you adopt. It doesn't matter how many Christian quotes that you put on your wall, yes. on your home, right? Uh, the Bible verses and things like that. It doesn't matter how hard you try to be a good person and be nice to your neighbors. If you haven't started at the gospel, yes. you have not started your Christian walk. Right. What is the gospel then? For a uh, gospel means good news. And the Apostle Paul, in the same letter, just a few chapters later, he spells out what the gospel is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, he says, Moreover, brother, he says, let's get down to the nitty gritty. I declare unto you the gospel wherein you have believed and wherein you are saved if you keep in your heart the commandments which I have delivered unto you. And then he expresses what the gospel is. He says, for I declared unto you how that Christ died according to the scripture. How he was buried and that he rose again in newness of life. Do you know the Bible tells us that we are to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? We're to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where does it tell us that? 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8. They say, obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this is the part of the sermon where uh, things are going to start sounding. If, if, if you're not used to coming here and used to hearing my preaching, things are going to start sounding a little unfamiliar. Because we read the whole Bible here, not just the passages that give us the warm fuzzies. Is that all right? So I want you to look with me. I'll read it if you have trouble finding it. You can just listen. James chapter 2, verses 20 through 26. Who is James? Well, James and Jude were the half-brothers of Jesus. They grew up in the same house with Jesus. And I believe that we can get a glimpse, because Jesus didn't actually write uh, his disciples wrote the things that he said. I think we can get a glimpse into the style, the mannerisms, the tones. Because although he was God incarnate in the flesh, he was just as much God as though he were not man. He was also just as much man as though he were not God. 
And as a man, he was Mary's baby. And he was John, uh, Jude and James's half-brother. And so I think when I read the book of Jude and read the book of James, I can kind of get a little bit of an extra glimpse into the, the style in which Jesus would have conveyed uh, his messages. And in James chapter 2, verses 20 through 26, this is what it says. Wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Abraham, the father of faith, was not fa- Abraham our father justified by works? Now see, that doesn't just, it doesn't sound right to the 21st century church, does it? It just doesn't, that's, just, that's not right. Was not Abraham justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son on the altar? See how faith with his works and by works was made perfect. Everyone say, Pastor Hayes. Pastor Hayes. You didn't write it. Didn't write James, it. Did. James did. Thank you. Okay, so you can't get mad at me. Get mad at James. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Verse 24. For you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Do you hear that? I'm going to read it again. So you see then that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise, Rahab the harlot was justified by her works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead... So faith without works is dead. So this is what I've come to tell you today. This is this is my do me as a as a minister of the gospel doing my due diligence. A partial gospel is not a gospel. A partial gospel, we are charged with preaching the whole counsel of God. We're charged with preaching the entirety of the gospel. Yes, believe on Jesus and you shall be saved. Everyone say that's true. That's true. true. Believe on Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. But if that's as far as you go, then you're just in the camp with the demons. Because isn't that what the Bible says? You believe in God, you do well, but the demons also believe in God. So it has to go beyond that somehow. And that's where the gospel of Jesus Christ becomes so clear. Uh, Sister Chantel pointed out uh, uh, the covenant, the importance of covenant relationship. And the, the book of the Bible, the whole Bible is about covenant. Did you know the Old Testament, the, the word testament means covenant? New Testament, that means new covenant. Did you know that God desires intimacy with humanity so much that he has entered into covenant relationships with us? And then we break them. And so in his love and his desire to be close to us, he creates a new covenant so that we can have intimacy with him and and relationship with him. And then what has humanity done? They've broken those and then he comes back again. And, and, and so finally, the ultimate covenant, which is Jesus Christ on the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So there are a few things about covenants. Uh, we have a young couple in here that are prayerfully considering getting married. So we started premarital counseling with them uh, this week. We had our first premarital counseling with them and, and I told them marriage is a covenant. God instituted marriage right in the very beginning of the Bible as a covenant, as a symbol of his relationship with you. Mm-hmm. And every covenant has a few things. It has the way you enter into the covenant. It has uh, 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 um, obligations that you're bound to in the covenant. It has uh, 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 there are benefits to being in the covenant. Um, obligations are, you know, I need to, you know, provide, I need to protect my wife. Um, benefits is I get to snuggle with her. That's a good benefit. You know, I get to cuddle with the wife, you know, things like that. Uh, and, and there's a sign of the covenant, right? We have a wedding ring. There's always a sign with, with the Jews. It was circumcision. With Christians, as we learned last week, the, the Apostle Paul says 
that baptism is Christian circumcision. Did you hear that? Baptism is Christian circumcision. So whatever circumcision was to the Jews, Paul says that's what baptism is to the church. Amen. But there's three things that I want to point out to you in particular about these covenants. There's a pattern in each one of them. There's grace. There's faith. And there's works. I'm going to say it again. There's grace. There's faith. And then there's works. In, in, the, in, in the six covenants that we see in the Bible between God and man, in all six of them, and our covenant today is no exception. And we're going to preach the whole gospel, not just part of it here. In every one of these, there's a pattern. There's grace. What is grace? Grace is the undeserved provision. It's the undeserved gift of salvation. That's grace. What is faith? Faith is you believing God concerning that provision. Are you following me? So he provides unmerited favor, right? We didn't, we didn't earn our salvation. He provides it for us. That's called grace. And then in faith, we accept and believe his sacrifice. We believe his provision for our salvation. But then the third part comes. Our response to, our response of faith to his grace. And that's called works. Yes. Let's look at a few of them. Uh, God's covenant with, uh, with Abraham. God's covenant with Adam and Eve in the garden. God's covenant with Noah. Uh, what are some of these things? Uh, Noah, there's judgment coming. But I'm going to provide you some grace. I'm going to save you. And so Noah says, I accept the salvation. I embrace the salvation. And he says, okay, you got to go build a boat. Amen. Would Noah's faith alone have saved him from the flood? Had he not been obedient to the gospel that God was delivering to him? And that's where we are today. Let me make it plain. Let me make it clear for you. Romans chapter 6 verses 3 through 4 says it this way. Don't you know that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ. Everyone say baptized. baptized. Were baptized into his death. Therefore, he goes on to say, we are buried with him by baptism. I'm going to say that again. We are buried with Christ by baptism yes. into his death so that as Christ was raised from the dead, even so we can rise into newness of life. Amen. Therefore, the gospel, death, burial, resurrection, he makes it very clear. We are to die to our old man of sin. We're to repent. You got to kill that old man. Yes. And I'm not talking about your daddy. You got to kill your old man. You got to kill that old self. You got you to you nail it to the cross and you have to say, Lord, I repent. I'm not just sorry that I've sinned. I'm making a commitment today not to sin anymore. I am killing my old man of sin. I am nailing him to the cross. And then the Bible says we are buried with Christ in baptism. Yes. So what is Christian uh, burial? How do we obey the gospel? We need to be buried with him in baptism. And then, everyone say then. Yeah. Look to your neighbor and say then. Yeah. Now look to your second choice and tell them then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then he gives you the promise that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, that you'll have the overcoming power to walk in newness of life. Then, everybody wants the part of the gospel where they're empowered 
And they are living large and they're blessed and prospering and, and they have uh, uh, the Holy Spirit power working and moving in their life. But I am telling you, you do not get there without going through the grave. You do not get to the overcoming power of Christianity without killing the old man, burying the old man and coming out on the other side. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. On the day of Pentecost, and I'm wrapping up, the Apostle Peter could not have made this any more clear. When he preached, like I'm preaching today, you're sinners. It's your fault that Jesus died on the cross. They were all grieved. They were cut to the heart. They were sad. And they said, very natural question, men and brethren, what shall we do? Everyone say do. do. And Peter did not say, you don't have to do anything. You just believe, so you're all set. That's not what he said. He said what you need to do is you need to repent of your sins. You need to kill that old man. And you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the washing, the cleansing, the remission of those sins. And then you shall, then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's like that old southern preacher said, if you repent and are baptized, you show enough will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Yes. It's a promise. It's a promise. If you're obedient, it's a promise. And have you noticed, Brother Aaron, how there's something in the plan of salvation and, and this gospel message of the death, burial, and resurrection? There's something in this. There's a role for all of us. Aspen, and I'm going to use you as an example. I hope you don't get mad at me and punch me later. Aspen repents of his sins. Yes. Then the church baptizes him. Yes. And then the Lord fills him with the Spirit. Amen? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I want to ask you a question today. Could we all stand as music comes? Would you... Obey the gospel. I want you to just meditate on that question for a second. Will you obey? We don't like that word. It's like, it's like we don't like that word in our mouth. Obey. Obey. It's, it's, it's a weird word. Say it. Obey, right? It's just weird. Um, we don't, we don't, we're Americans. We don't obey anybody. We're, we're free. You know, the whole eagle, you know, the whole thing. You know, we're there. Uh, but you have to obey the gospel because it is about submitting ourselves to God. If you're willing to obey the gospel, there's good news. Listen, here's, remember I said grace, faith works. Here it goes. You ready? Here's the grace that Jesus provides an escape from the eternal consequences of sin on the cross. There's the grace. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. He's offering it to you free of charge. Amen. Faith. Do you believe that Jesus' blood was shed to pay for your sins? That's where the faith comes in. Right? But then the works. Arise, why tarriest thou? Be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Death, repent, burial, baptism, resurrection, filled with his spirit. It is really that simple. It's the gospel that the first century church preached. And it's the gospel I'm going to preach until the Lord comes back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I want every head bowed, every eye closed, every mind, mind centered right on the Lord. And I want, I'm going to pray a prayer. And uh, if you're a Christian and you're a believer, I promise there's not going to be anything in this prayer that you're not going to want to say. So you're welcome to pray it along with me. Um, but specifically, I'd like for you to pray it along with me so that those who may be praying it for the first time today won't feel like they're doing it alone. Is that okay? Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. 
I believe that you were buried. And three days later, you rose again. So that I could rise in new life. I know I'm a sinner. And I know my sin separates me from you. So I ask you to forgive me of my past. As I pledge that I will live differently tomorrow. Thank you for hearing my prayer. And for being merciful to me.